Welcome to Rock Solid Productions, where in this video we are going to show you how to improve the video quality output of an NES top loader using one of the Kevtris HDMI mod kits. Hello everybody and welcome to Rock Solid Productions. My name is Gary, your host here on the channel. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm really glad that you found us. Do me a favor, we have at the time of this filming over 250 videos on the channel. Go ahead and check out other things that we have on here too. I'm sure that you'll find something that you'll enjoy. Also, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way each and every time we do come out with new content, you're kept most up in the know. One of my favorite systems, probably my second favorite system of all times, has to be the original NES, and later on, the NES top loader, the NES 2. Now, the NES 2 did have some different components in it from the original NES. One of the original problems with the original NES, many of us know, is the blinking light of death, where basically you put a game in, and the red light just blinks and blinks and blinks. Well, now, thankfully, 30-odd oh, years later, we can fix that with the Blinking Light Win mod, which completely eliminates that 72-pin connector with a and replaces it with a new one, eliminates the pop-down mechanism altogether, and gives you a much more solid overall connection. And well, a lot of people like this one, I have a soft spot for this guy here. This is the NES Tour, the NES Top Loader, and it was designed by the same individual who designed the US version of the Super NES. That's why you see a lot of the same lines. You know, the controllers kind of look alike. You know, there's a lot of similarities design-wise, aesthetically, between the NES 2 and the US Super NES, for better or for worse. Now, with the Super or with the NES 2, one of the things that they tried to do, because this was released after the Super NES was already out there, this had a $50 original price point, and the goal was to make an inexpensive system that people could play the plethora, or plethora if you're like a WAPO, uh, the plethora of games that are out there or were out there for the original NES, but do so at a much reduced price point. To do that, though, they had to take out some functionality that the original NES had. One of the, the most notable features that is gone from the original NES, the AV ports. This is RF only. Basically with that, well, it looks like an audio video jack on the back. It's just an RCA jack that goes out to the back of your TV into an RF modulator and connects to the coaxial input on the back of your TV. RF signals suck. They're terrible. There was no direct AV option for the NES 2. Now, there are other people out there who have done AV mods of this system to basically give it the same type of audio video output that the toaster had. I didn't want to do that because I have this. I don't need that in this system. I got this system this year for my girlfriend, Ginger, for my birthday. And as soon as I got it, the one thing I knew I wanted to do with it was HDMI modded. And Kevtris, the same guy behind the HDMI kits that go into like the AVS and the uh, analog NT, that's the same basic kit that we'll be putting into this system. Now, I've got to tell you, I've RGB modded my N64, my Super NES Junior. This modification scares the hell out of me because if you don't do it right, you can trash this system. And they're not cheap. I mean, yeah, they're not super expensive. You can get them for about $100 now in decent shape. And that's what this one was here. But still, this is a piece of Nintendo history that I don't want to be the one to screw up. So I would say, before you even think about doing this, if you are not at an expert level of soldering and desoldering, because it's the desoldering that's going to get you on this one, don't attempt it. There are modders out there who will do this for you if you hire them to do so. You can send them the HDMI mod kit, send them your system, they'll charge you an installation fee, and go from there. If I didn't have access to a, an industrial commercial grade Heiko desoldering iron that we'll be using in this, I would not be attempting this. If I hadn't been soldering for over 25 years, I wouldn't be attempting this. And even still, my soldering skills, eh, I can get a little gloppy from time to time. So I am a little bit concerned about that. So if you have any doubts in your soldering skills, don't do this, let a professional do this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, we're gonna throw it on our bench real quick, 
disassemble it and get the main board out of here and then we're going to head to the lab where we're going to get to work and so it begins here we have our top loader on the bench there are one two three four screws on the underside that we are going to use our 4.5 millimeter security bit driver to remove and just like that it's open i'm going to put the security bits in here or the security screws i mean in there Wow, you can see all the dust and everything in here. We are definitely going to blow this out before we get soldering. But we have one, two, three, four, five screws, I believe, is all that is holding this in right now. And keep track so you have the gold or the copper looking screws that go here. And those are silver towards the top where the cartridge goes into the system. And we're going to take that shield off you can see there's not only dust bunnies in here but there's outright dust rabbits and like that we are out and uh, now the real work begins so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be removing these two chips off of the board they'll be going right back on but they will have some interposers that go underneath them before they go back on the board this is the ppu here this is the cpu and then we'll also be on soldering these three legs here and then there's a bunch of capacitors underneath there those may be the only caps in this kit that we'll be replacing we'll check it out uh, in a moment but uh, we are ready to get a toothbrush and some isopropyl alcohol or some dynamite magnum force clean this off and get to soldering actually get to desoldering so let's get started with the desoldering now i'm using a Heiko 472d and what I like about this is just how small and lightweight everything is here. You can hear the pump going. So here goes, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. I'm nervous about this, and I can lie. So the interesting theory, thing here is, as I'm putting the desoldering iron on each of the pins, I can actually feel it as it kind of slips over as the solder becomes molten again, letting me know when I should be able to suck it up. So learning a little bit here that it seems like I will apply to the other side here is up. This going kind of hanging down, it's giving me a good spot to suck that solder out of. That's not nearly as clean. It's like there you can see these are coming out super nice. All right, took a little bit and this is definitely time consuming. But here we have, come on. CPU, don't force it out. Ever you do. There we go. Once you have the CPU out, you'll want to inspect the, the pins, make sure there's no damage, that you didn't pull any off or have any traces left on the board, and we didn't, so we're good. One thing I found on the CPU is if you look at the top side, like right there, I can actually see there's still one, two, three, four, fifth pin, and there's still solder.
So it looks like I got three pins that are being difficult. One, four, and five on that side. There may be something where I have to actually hit them with some fresh solder to be able to unsolder them, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Finally, there's the PPU. Again, we'll inspect the, the pins and everything and make sure they're okay. But man, that was a pain. Now, one thing, looking at the instructions that I did kind of bass backwards, is they are calling for us to place the sockets on the PPU and CPU. So we'll do that quick. Don't force this because you don't want to break these pins. Oop, and you want to make sure that you get them in the right holes. So there's that one. Snap it off right there. Push those bad boys up. This is the PPU and we will place that on the motherboard. There we go. And we're going to tack down the four corners here. Now one thing you may or may not notice here is some of these pins are starting to fall through. You'll want to push up on the underside here um, just to make sure that you are getting the right height on the pins. So we have those tacked down. I can pull the PPU at this point um, because the other socket will actually go in here. So back at the home base and uh, we're going to finish up soldering. Um, everything that we have done to this point has been desoldering. So we have everything ready to go initially here. And what I'm going to use, I'm going to use a drag solder technique where I'm going to hit the pins here and work my way down. Make sure you tin your iron before you really start. I'm going a little bit faster. I'll go back in a second and check for any bridging and clean that up. The main thing is you don't want to leave your iron on any one pin too long because you can actually damage both the board and the integrated circuit below. And we'll do the same thing on this side. And consider this less a tutorial and more a documentary because I'll admit I've made several mistakes on this um, and which we'll outline in the close some other tips and tricks along the way. Now one thing I did not do, which you can do, and I'll do on the, um, on, the peep, or on the CPU pins, is you can actually introduce a little bit of solder flux. Now no clean solder flux is the best. I actually left mine in the lab. So we'll be using just traditional flux. Now this you'll need to go back and clean. I'll just take a little bit on my finger and do it that way. That's what she said. And all that this will do is really promote the adhesion of the solder and the pins together. And again, we'll use that same drag technique, tin your iron first, and then boom, shakalaka. And again, making sure you're cleaning up any bridging. And just like that, we have the socket soldered back on the board. Now, before I provide power, I'm gonna clean this off a little bit. One of the steps that I missed that Jason outlines is after you have the CPU and PPU sockets in, put the CPU and PPU in, hook it back up, and test it to see if it works. I never did that. In fact, I never tested this system before I started this mod. When I got this for my birthday from, from Ginger, it was from a trusted retailer I figured, they tested it, it worked well, just go with it. That was my first mistake. My second mistake was not testing it after I socketed the PPU and CPU. So now this is the CPU, and this is the CPU board. So let's see how that's gonna go. So the way that this interposer works is the fact that You'll have a row of pins here and a row of pins here that you solder on from these guys. And the CPU will end up straddling that. 
Um, so we'll get to that in just a few moments. So basically the best way to do that is just get everything lined up there. And now at this point, you can just break that off right there. And we can solder tack there and there, and then there and there. And then we can, whoop, not that one, that one. And then we can actually get this put back onto the board in a minute. So what I'm gonna do here too is I'm gonna put just a little bit of no clean solder flux on. And the best technique I've seen for this has been to hit the pins on either end and then come through and do the middle. Now what I'm going to do to make this a little bit easier, I actually clamp this in my little vise here. Careful, they're hot. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not going to hold it so that like it's smushing the board. I just want it to kind of hold it so I can hit it with the soldering iron and do kind of like a drag technique on here. One thing you want to make sure too is that you're not bridging any of these pins. Now, Jason does offer a version of this kit that has this work all done for you. I think it costs you about an extra $10. Might not be uh, a bad thing to have them take care of this for you. So now we have one interposer board built. And next what we're going to do is we're going to get the sockets in and solder them on that side and that side. So now you can actually get these from uh, GameTech.us with this pre-assembled for you. I decided to save the $10 and do it myself. Um, you can kind of see the pain that I went through doing that, so I would definitely advise spend the $10. And now we're going to get the PPU ones inside. Again, make sure you notate which is the PPU pin, which one is the NES pin, because they are not the same uh, across the two boards here. So the NES pin goes on the outside here above to the top on the CPU board and it goes to the inside on the PPU pin. Now that I turn that around, I just want to make sure that I have that right. Yep, NES. And you can just pop that off there. NES. Now what you can do too, now that this is cooled off, we're going to go to the PPU side, which is right there. And we can actually put these into the sockets on the board. And what that will do is help maintain our alignment. As we solder, same thing. I'm gonna put just a little bit of flux actually on the pins themselves. And if you want, you can put some on the top of the board as well. There we go. And we are going to use the exact same drag solder technique you just saw me use. So I'm going to do the bottom side first. Take your time on this because you're actually going to need to tweak this a little bit before we can put the PPU on. There we go, we've got that side done. This is much easier than the way I did the CPU pins, I'll tell you that much. Pretty! So now we're ready to solder the PPU on the board and we're going to pop this out of the sockets here. Now one thing, and we'll bring the PPU in so you can see the solder job that we have there. So one issue that you'll run into if you're building the interposers yourself is you actually have to trim the pins on this side that come through because there's just not enough clearance on the socket. So with that, you'll just take a set of flush cuts and come in and hit each one slightly. And all that we're doing here is we're providing clearance for the socket over these pins. Actually, I see that pin needs a little bit of solder, so we're going to hit that real quick, too. There we go. 
and be careful if you touch it afterwards because it's going to be hot. So we're going to take our socket and line up. There's a little 40 up here. I'm going to line that up with the top of the board and now it sits much better. So now we're going to come through and we need to solder the socket to the um, interposer board. And again, I'm just going to take a little bit of flux and coat the pins. This is probably the most difficult part of this part, to which why I'm going to get my helping hands. We'll get our clamp in place. And I apologize, this is going to be more for my being able to see than for the camera necessarily. We'll show you the, finish, the finished work here though when we're done with it. That side actually worked pretty well. That side looks pretty good. There we go. That interposer socket is finished for the PPU at least. And we'll get the P CPU in a moment. And just like on the PPU, there is a 40 pin that gets notched on there. But again, we need to uh, snip the pins to make sure that we have clearance on this side and we'll set our throw our helping hands on the floor and snip the tips it's a good time too when you're doing this inspect your solder joints and 40 goes that way the reason I'm doing that I had some of the pins got bent a quick and easy way just to make sure they're realigned. We're good there. And actually just like before we're going to get a little bit of flux on here and a lot of this job is just letting gravity help you too. So we're going to tack down the four corners or maybe not maybe we'll just do it. Go back, clean up any bridging. And that side is done, although I'm not liking how that pin looks. There we go. And now we will hit this side. And again, this is the inside is always gonna be the more challenging of the two to get. No bridges on that one, everything looks good. So now we have our two interposers done. The one thing you need to make sure that you do too is you don't confuse which is your CPU and which is your PPU. This is our CPU. Looking for the notch there, which will correspond with the notch under there. Gently put it in, do not bend your pins. CPU is in. Same thing, you need to double check the notch and notch. Be very careful you don't bend any pins break any pins because that would leave you with a very bad day. Slowly rock it back and forth until it pops into place. There's one side, there's the other. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the capacitors on the board that need to be replaced and also going to get the transistor removed from here too. There's these three legs right there. So we're gonna go There's a lot of solder around there. There's one. There's two. Those transistor legs are pretty thick. Move this bad boy. Set those aside for just a moment. Actually, I needed that one, not the one I removed. I thought that screw looked different. It does. I don't think we got to remove that. I think just this. Yep. And the transistor pulled straight out. What we're going to do is unscrew that slightly, and we're going to tuck it back up into there ever so slightly. 
That way, if we ever need it again in the future, we have it. Now, before we go back underneath here, we are going to replace that big barrel capacitor there. That is a 25 volt, 1000 milliamp. Oh, so I was looking for, there's one, two, three, four, five capacitors in here. I could find one, two, three, four. The fifth one is hiding behind this big one right there. So I need that bad boy right there. Now I have left the switch on on the system for a bit to make sure that any and all capacitors have been discharged. Our 15... 100 milliamp, 25 volts. And before we go back in there, I do want to show you here close on the board. It is actually labeled positive and negative, so you know your polarity. And then that's the other little guy we got to get out right there. And it's those two pins right there. And that one was a royal pain in the keister to get out of there. That's a 50 volt, one microfarad. Was that guy right there? Insert those two back in the board and solder them both up at the same time. I'm gonna bend the legs out that way it provides a little bit of tension. So when I go back to solder, it's kind of holding it in place for me. Now capacitors are ridiculously easy to screw up if you overheat them. So we need to make sure that we are in and out quickly. I'm gonna hit these with a little bit of um, this is no clean solder flux. Tack that one, tack that one. Those two look pretty good. We'll come back and we'll touch them up in a second though. Perfect. When you are done soldering, your solder joint should have a very nice shiny look to them. I'm gonna come in here with a set of flush cutters and we're just gonna cut off the extra little little bits of the legs. Two new capacitors there, no problem. And back in there right and shiny like they should be. Now we are going to put the shield back on. Now these you can just throw in the garbage, you don't need them any longer. And we are going to put our shield back up. I would not recommend using a power screwdriver on this. You don't want to strip these up and ruin them. Okay. Next we have one, two, three capacitors to replace. They are different values, so we'll start with that one there. Desolder that one. Here we go with that one. That one is a 47 microfarad. There we go, that bad boy there. And positive leg is on the top. And just like the other ones, we're gonna take it, spread its legs out. And we're gonna do that to all of these and solder them all back in at once. Got it. And that bad Johnny was 50 volt, one microfarad, which I'm guessing is gonna be this guy here. 50 volt, one microfarad. So there's that. That one's good, not hitting anything else. We have our final little one right over there. So we did tack down everything here capacitor wise. Use just a little bit again of the no clean solder flux just to boop, 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 hit everything there. Um, the last thing I'm going to do here is um, just kind of clean the board up. Finish with installing the PPU and CPU back into the uh, system itself here and we're gonna do a little bit other minor cleaning you can see the dust and crap that's still in here uh, we, we are getting very close to bundling everything back up the hard part the desoldering we're done with that everything now is installation and solder now at this point we need to unlock the zip connector here 
And then this bad boy down, just slides in with the contacts up. So we're gonna go like that and then get it locked back in. PPU is locked and loaded. Again, contacts up. And now we can take and place the each one into the board. And the lines up like so. Don't force it. You don't want to bend or break a pin as you're doing this. There's that. And that is now on the board. Put it on the board. Yes. For you White Sox fans out there, get the PP on there. All right. CPU, PPU in place on the board. Again, just double checking. Everything looks good. No uh, bad solder joints there. All right. Next up, we need to solder our wire from here that'll go to the main board. And for this, we need to just prep a little bit of wire. And we are going to just give those a dunk. Basically, the two points we're going to solder to are going to be that center pin is ground, and then we're going to use that pin there as well. And we are going to tin these before we solder them to the board. There's one. There's two. You can actually just insert these wires right into the board. Although these are a bit long, but there's nothing on the other side now, so we're okay. There's one. There's two. Give them a slight tug and you know that they're good. Now on the main board here of the conversion, you have a spot here labeled ground and that one L8, that's your ground. That is where the uh, hot goes to on here. So now I'm gonna actually mark that with some black marker here. Just, yep, that's ground. You do not wanna solder over the console just in case you get a blob of solder or something that does not go where it's supposed to be. There we go, oh, come on, there we go. Tin these first. There's one pad. There's two. Those look good. There's the ground. There we go. We have all of the wiring now done as far as soldering, I hope. You're going to soft install everything into the case now at this point because I still need to make my trimmings and whatnot right here. So that will go like that. The board will come around like that. And then we have CPU and PPU that will go that way. And I'm going to lock that zip connector in place. Lock that one in place. I will have to remove the plastic right here for the HDMI cable or port to fit. And again, that's where having a marker helps so pretty much that whole tab i will remove I'll probably break out my dremel here in a little bit for this my main thing is i just want to get it mocked up so we can test it out here like i say i'll get my dremel out and i will clean this up in a little bit but for the time being that will lay in there still need to Get a little bit of that out. Looks like. So that will go in there. And this will come around like that. And eventually what I will do here too is get that routed a little bit more cleanly. But we'll have to take a little bit out of that too. I'm too excited though to see how this works. Fingers crossed. Let's hit the TV. So I know there's like fake playing for the camera nerves and there's real nerves. These are real nerves here. Um, if I screwed something up, I can ruin this system. 
It was more challenging than I anticipated. I've got everything hooked up. I don't have the power hooked up yet, so that's gonna be one of the first uh, first things. We're documenting everything here. So if I screw it up, it's gonna be on camera. Power light is on on that. Still nothing through to the capture card. Solid light now on that. Could be the game, could be the game. Because it's outputting something. A game I know works. A game I know works. Castlevania. I got nothing. All I got is a gray screen. Son of a I it up, guys. Way to go. Way to go, dumb So here's some total and 100% transparency with you guys. Um, I debated about deleting and not including the part where I turned the system on and it didn't work. But that wouldn't have been honest. That would have been very disingenuous. And that's not who I am. I ran into troubles with this installation and take this more as a documentary of my going through this process versus step-by-step um, -step instructions. Jason over at GameTechUS.com has a great series going through the entire process. Follow that to a T. I didn't, which caused some problems. So here's what's going on. Yeah, the, the NES HDMI kit it's working, but not on the system that it was originally supposed to go to. This is actually the system that I started working on. One of the steps that I missed that Jason outlines is after you have the CPU and PPU sockets in, put the CPU and PPU in, hook it back up, and test it to see if it works. I never did that. In fact, I never tested this system before I started this mod. I've I cannot praise Jason over at GameTechUS.com enough with the assistance he has been to me via email. Um, I am an advanced soldering individual. I don't want to call myself an expert. I'm not an expert. There are people who do a much better job than I. I'm not to Voltar's level. I'm not to Jason's level. But I know how to use a soldering iron very well. Um, I wanted to show that even someone with my skills can run into issues. So in talking to Jason, what we've kind of diagnosed is it's either the CPU or PPU on the original system or the two blank spaces here is the SRAM that can go bad as well. All four chips, according to what he has told me, he's had all four chips fail on a system before. I actually have one of our Twitter followers or put his uh, ID here on screen is actually sending me one of his systems that has a broken motherboard. I'm gonna transfer this chipset on here, see if it works, go from there. Um, but this, if you have any doubt whatsoever, if you go to Walmart and buy a soldering iron to do this modification, don't do this modification. There are so many things that you can screw up and can go wrong. And I had the right tools to do this and I still screwed it up. Thankfully, I was able to resurrect it here with the second system, but it cost me another 70, 75, $80 to buy a second system. But now one thing that I was not anticipating when I got this system in, and just to show that this is actually coming through this system, off, on, give it a sec. It takes a second for my capture card because I'm running through my EasyCap 284. Boop, there you go. It's a beautiful picture. But one thing I was not anticipating, Disney's Darkwing Duck. I got this in Germany from AB Games. It's a PAL game. I can play PAL games on this. Now, I've never actually tested PAL games in my regular NES, so I didn't know if they played, but even the fact that this is compatible with it, freaking cool, how cool is that? So the last thing that we have to do on this system is we need to, as you see, I have the uh, HDMI uh, adapter or the actual kit itself still hanging outside. We need to modify the bottom of this case so that we can fit everything inside and seal it up. We're nearing in on the end. We just have to do a few final things here. And one of it, 
is we need to mount that board inside here. And to do that, we need to mod the underside of the chassis, which I've actually done a little bit of. So what you'll need to do is, you know, I like to use a Sharpie just to mark the edges of the board. I had actually started to cut that out after I had the initial system installed and after the heartbreak that that was, I never got any further on it. So uh, looking at it, we have spots there and there and there and there that we need to cut out. Couple ways we can do that. First of all, you can take a set of flush cutters and come at it and just start cutting in. And that actually ricocheted off of my chest. Make sure that you're using protective eyewear when doing this. But that still isn't a great way to do it. I've also got a hobby knife with an actual serrated bit on it. I also have my Dremel tool handy, which is probably what we're gonna end up doing here in a minute. What I don't like about the saw technique is you can score the bottom there. And generally speaking, a hobby knife or an X-Acto knife is kind of hard to cut through this. That's why I like using a rotary tool such as this that has an actual cutting bit on the end. Now this will take more than a few passes. And as you can see, it kind of melts the plastic as it goes along. And then you can clean this up with a hobby knife. And we're clear I actually did remove more material than I needed to. So that's one of those where it's important to Measure twice, cut once. But now that that's in, I can sit this up top and kind of see where I need to go there and there. So I'm gonna come in like so. And like so. Now what I'm actually going to do here because you don't need, again, to go down all that far. I am gonna to switch to a hobby knife. And we're going to just slowly etch this. And the goal is to try to, again, not take off too, material, too much material like I did on the underside. That actually does irk me quite a bit. Now, if I wanted to, again, I could come in here with my rotary tool and cover that up. And the main thing if you're going to do this is keep the bit leveled. You don't want to angle one way or the other. Again, we'll just take our hobby knife and we're going to shave that little bit of flashing off. There we go. And same on the back side. Need to level that out a little bit yet. Bowed up a little bit there. Coming underneath the channel side, I think I'll take the hobby knife and just level that out a little bit. Now the last thing we need to do before we seal everything up is there is a little small piece of foam that you put on the board on the main chip here, right like so. And they'll kind of give you that spongy feel, but as long as everything oop, lines up, there we go. And now we can seal it back up. Okay, I could have been a little bit neater with my cutting to get the HDMI port on there. Quite honestly, I was just too damned excited. Again, this is more a documentary, less a tutorial. So battle toads, which we know can cause issues with some systems. Let's check and see if it loads up. Bam. Now the other thing you can do too, going into the systems menu, and I don't mean the systems menu on the cartridge, I mean in the actual conversion kit. Um, if you press select and left, it'll bring up the, the high def adapter menu. You can change your resolution. I have it set to 1920 by 1080. You can drop it down to uh, 720 by uh, 10 or 1280 by 720. You can even go back to your original 640 by 480 as well. There's a bunch of video options for stretch, scaling, scan lines, palette, cropping, despeckle. There's audio options where you can enable different, you know, uh, sound chip application. Basically, I say would say it would be the best way to say it. Um, you can pan, change the volumes. Uh, you can go in. There's a whole lot of things. You can overclock the system if you wanted to. Um, great for speed running if you wanted to cheat that way. 
and a whole lot more. Um, and the system looks great. Now, like I say, I look at this more as a documentary than a tutorial how to do this. Uh, don't ask me to do this for you on your system. I'm going to turn it down because I don't want to go through what I went through on my system on somebody else's. If you want to have this done, Voltar's Mod Shop is who I would absolutely recommend to have this done to your system. There are other things I could have done to the system as well, like I did not do the LED mod kit. Eh, I didn't really feel the need for it. In testing, I could have absolutely used it because this just has the power switch up down and LED would have at least let me know that it was getting power. Uh, but this is a great setup and one of the things that I am looking forward to do is, we have it right over here, hang on. We need to do some live streams on original hardware featuring the Holy Diver limited edition kit available from Retrobit and Castlemania Games. And if you haven't gotten one yet, you may not get one. They're pretty close at this point in time to being completely sold out. And I just cannot wait to see it on original hardware via HDMI using this kit. The other thing, you know, I've mentioned Jason over at GameTech uh, GameTechUS.com. This is Kevtris, is the man behind this conversion kit. He's the same guy that, these are essentially the same internals as the AVS and as the Analog NT. And I have it in an original top loader. How cool is that? Uh, this will also work with the uh, 60 to 72 pin adapters that are out there if you want to be able to play Famicom games through this. Very similar process if you have an AV Famicom and you'd want to do this mod uh, to a lot of the same concerns. Now, the cool thing, at least for me, with trying to get the other system, this one here, back up and running. The capacitors that are on here and the PPU, CPU, and SRAM, it's actually the same as a front loader. So if that system that I have, one of the fans of the show sending in, if I can't make those work, I can always buy you know, a used top loader that's just in terrible shape, as long as the motherboard's in good shape and use it to try to resurrect this system. This has been an ordeal, guys. Um, it's been a very stressful two weeks. Oh, one other thing I've got to say, if you're going to do this conversion, do not use one of those universal multi-outs. Um, I think that may have been what damaged my system when I put the conversion in. See, those AC adapters actually have a DC output. The original NES AC adapter outputs 9 volts AC, and that's important. And if you use the wrong AC versus DC, you can damage components, and I honestly do think that's what happened here. Um, so make sure that if you are going to do this, you are using original Nintendo AC adapters. Um, let me know what you think down in the comments. Um, what, is this something that you would consider doing yourself? Would you have someone do it for you? Would you enjoy having a system like this? Let me know down in the comments. You can also always email me, as always, always, as always, yes, it's the Department of Redundancy Department. I'm excited to play the system, but you can email me over at rocksolidmail at gmail.com. Hit me up on Twitter at Rock Solid Studios, or we've always got the conversation going on over on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash rocksolidproductions. And if you want to help contribute to the show and get early access to all of our videos, behind the scenes, exclusive videos, you can do so by helping us over on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash rocksolid. For as little as a dollar a month, you do get early access to all of our video content, exclusive one-on-ones with me, and a whole lot more. You can also support the channel by heading on over to our Teespring store, and I will have that link on screen right here, right now. We've got a bunch of different t-shirts, sweatshirts, cooler weather's getting ready to hit. Outfit yourself with the latest from Rock Solid Productions over on our Teespring site. If you're interested in picking up one of these kits, you can do so too when he has them in stock. These are handmade units between Cavtris and Jason over at GameTech.us, uh, GameTechUS.com. Make sure you check him out. And again, if you need to have it installed, Voltar's Mod Shop, he's the same guy that does the uh, RGB restoration kit here on the Super NES Junior and on the N64. He's a really sharp dude and does exceptional work as well. Finally, if you do need additional things like I've used a ton of one-up cars to clean my games, to clean this system. It was gross. It was so gross. 
head on over to castlemaniagames.com. He's got the full line of one-up cleaners and accessories and a whole lot more. He's got the game bits you'll need to get in the systems in your cartridges over at castlemaniagames.com. Don't forget if you use promo code ROX10, you'll get 10% off of most items on the site and orders of $20 and up, you do get free shipping and handling in the lower 48 states. Um, I'm geeked. I cannot wait to live stream. Holy Diver, if you're seeing this after the fact, make sure you check the archives. We'll have this archived when we do this too. Um, tremendous learning experience. I'm glad that I finally got it working. I wish I would not have had the issues with this setup here, but it was my own fault. Oh, don't forget, hit that subscribe button too. That way, anytime we do do streams, do do. I do that all the time, I catch myself. Anytime we have streams going, you're kept up to date when we upload new videos and a whole lot more if you hit that subscribe button, especially if you hit that bell notification too. You'll join the notification squad. So I am Gary. This has been Rocksaw Productions on how I killed and resurrected via HDMI my NES top loader. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Ginger, for the birthday present. I'm sorry I broke it. We'll see you soon.